uh, today. And it's a matter that cuts across the types of modeling that we have been pursuing here, okay? Um, it's really about contrasting the uh, behaviors, uh, and, but more the organizational style seen on the one hand in soft flow modeling, so systemodynamics, aggregate modeling on the one hand, and with agent-based modeling on the other. And it has to do with a term I've used many, many times from this floor. And the term is heterogeneity. When I say heterogeneity, anyone have a sense of roughly what that refers to? Yes. Uh, so Mr. Dashati, yes. Differences. Differences between people, excellent. Variety, you could, you could, might say diversity in the population. People differ. And those differences often strengthen us. They lead to you know, differences in different lived experience, people's backgrounds often enriches different ways people think about problems, allows people to approach it from different angles and, and many other good benefits. And there may be a time we explore the dynamics of it, but I, I want to talk today about the ways in which those differences, that variety, that heterogeneity, manifests in the structure of our models. Structure statically, that is, when I, when I say statically within a model, what do I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of using a term that's actually more of a computer science term strictly than, you know, first and foremost, a modeling term. But when I say statically, what anyone have a sense within computer science? Yeah, Francisco. Yeah, they don't change. Yeah, they don't, they don't change. And, and they're, you know, in, in computer science, we, we make a distinction between kind of when we specify a system. Um, and we might be, for example, compiling it or building it and, and so on. And then what's what's the thing that's compared with that when we do what with that system? When we execute it, we run it, right? And, and we, in computer science, we call the first of those when we specify the system, characterize the system. And often we undertake tasks like compiling it. That's called static. That's, those are the static characteristics. It's before it's run. It has to do with its organizational style and structure of the code base, etc. By contrast, when we run it, there's all sorts of runtime structures created. Anyone in those from software engineering background? So most computer scientists, in fact, sort of a sense of like some structures that are created at runtime. When you run a program, give me an example of something that's that's created then. Dynamic. Yeah, the memory, the heat, right? The, the, the dynamically allocated memory, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have heaps created. Well, okay, I'm using heaps in two different senses. You might you might have a uh, a red block tree or a splay tree, or you might have a link list that's created and that, that's representing data, for example, right? So that's an excellent thing. What's another thing that occurs at runtime, like when you're running the program, at the dynamics of the program? Yes. Virtual memory. Virtual memory. So, so virtual memory is, is an abstraction that allows us to represent, to capture memory of the system. And, What's virtual about it is it, it hides the fact what's in the so-called RAM, the random access memory, versus what's on disk, where we recognize the ECAs that it's no longer always a, a spinning disk anymore. Um, yeah. Um, uh, 
Yeah, we just got to the states around the state. That's right. And so we have our runtime stack. Yeah. Right when A calls B and B calls C and C calls D, right there are these activation records get pushed on the stack and they get popped off the stack. I don't know how much you folks remember this, but it's when a program runs, there's lots of stuff going on that are that go beyond what's immediately specified in your program. It's kind of implied by that the runtime behavior that that's implied. Um, I'm right from start. And when we have models, we have this distinction as well, kind of what's specified in the model itself, the structure of the model. And then what's actually realized at runtime when we execute the model, when we simulate the model. And that may be rather more elaborate, particularly where, for what type of prediction that we've been examining, would that difference be the biggest? You think for a system dynamics model, or for an agent based model? An agent based model. Agent -based model. So for an agent based model, you might say, when you start the button model, you might say, hey, there's a population of size 10,000. Right? And people have these characteristics and these big charts or whatever. But when you run it, a bunch of agents get created and they interact and they each have characteristics and so on. And they may have relationships with each other. There may be networks created that are quite rich and, and that involve structure that, again, is merely implied by the model. The static model starts to be specified. Really? So for agent based models, there's this kind of world of difference between what you specify, what you stipulate as sort of the structure of the model, and then what's actually represented while it's being simulated. A bigger population, a smaller population, you know, a scale free network being represented. And, and that's not in your program per se that there's a scale free network. No, it's not in your model. But the logic to generate it is in your model. Mm -hmm. Are people following here? Because when we get into this lecture, we're going to see this as next. So this lecture is about how we capture heterogeneity. And particularly with an emphasis on that runtime, on that. So we're going to reflect on heterogeneity, and we're going to talk about the very different ways we represent them. And I'm going to introduce a visual metaphor for representing that um, in each modeling tradition that compares and contrasts how these um, how these uh, different approaches, the system dynamics and soft flow and then agent based uh, contrast that information. And then we're going to look at some of the mathematics behind this and, and particularly the scaling, how these ways of approaching it scale, how they, as, as the number of types of heterogeneity grow, how the burden or Amount of information they have to keep track of changing. Mm -hmm. The doubling, the amount of heterogeneity types of heterogeneity you have, how does that impact, you know, the, the amount of information that has to be kept at runtime? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, we're going to be talking about a diverse population, a varied population. So for, for simplicity, I'm just going to use this. This metaphor to imagine a population out there that we wish to characterize. So imagine out there in the population, there are people with different characteristics, and we might say that they have a uh, sex and an ethnicity and an income. And and I don't mean to suggest that um, these are by any means in a, a full accounting or even an adequate accounting. I'm just imagining some differences between things in the population between people. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you to 
to kind of just reflect on two different ways we might keep track of heterogeneity. So I'm going to kind of simplify that down in its most extreme um, to think about heterogeneity in, in, in the simplest possible way. So we're going to have a bunch of shapes and colors and in a given one of these, well, the certain shape here, square or circle, I know it looks kind of like so, let's see, um, and a certain color, green or red. Hmm? This is a population that exhibits variety, it exhibits differences, right? It exhibits um, uh, heterogeneity. Hmm. And I, I'm going to ask you to reflect just as a starting little exercise that we could take this population and without any loss of information or, or gain of information, we could kind of stack up those which are alike. We're going to be assuming for, for this discussion right now that imagine, imagine that, remember, modeling is about abstraction, it's about hiding detail leaving out certain detail and focusing on certain details of relevance to our problem. Remember that idea of models as maps? They leave, they're useful because they leave out information, right? They're precisely useful because they allow us to cut through this welter cacophony of different information, focusing on the things we think are most salient and learn from that model so we can do better. The model doesn't reflect exactly the world. It doesn't reflect the truth, but it speeds us towards the truth by helping us think through what we do have represented. How, how does that relate to what we might see in the world? So here, imagine that only color and shape are the salient things we wish to keep track of here. Okay, just color and shape. I think you'd agree we could take this without loss of information or gain of information, we could just stack up the number that are sort of like, right? So we'll stack up the square, the green squares. We'll stack up the red squares that happen to be only one of them. We'll stack up the green circles and the red circles. Well, we can do that, right? Let's just say we can, right? Now, I would argue that the information here on the left, where you have a stack of these squares, and you can say one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Stack of these, you can say one. Stack of this, you can say one. And stack of these, you say three. Um, that we could summarize that information in as much as, if that's all we wish to keep track of, we could just as well have a little table here like this, right? Little, a little lookup table, right? Let's say, based on color, if we're concerned about green squares, there are four of them. Green circles, there's one of them. Red squares, there's one, and red circles, there's three. That that summarizes for our interest. If all we care about is here is color and shape, then this information. Well, it has lots of details spatially and so on that we don't care about. It can be summarized by this table. Do you agree with that? Are we comfortable with that idea? That we can kind of boil down this information into the so-called cross-tab, cross-tabulation. We have a certain number of a given a color and a shape. We have a certain count. Are we good with that? Alternatively, we might deal with these facts of things, but there it, it's not really buying us a lot more, right? It's it's kind of potato, potato, tomato, tomato. There's two ways of storing this information. And you could argue about the maybe this one's a bit prettier, maybe not. Um, maybe this one is a bit more succinct or something, a bit more structured, but I think you'd agree that this is the same information. Are you comfortable with that? If we are say, if we're all in agreement that only shape and color matter. Hmm? Hmm? Okay, just bear with me. Okay, so we're gonna see 
when it comes to heterogeneity, that the two types of organization we have for our models are going to, at some level, reflect this choice. Okay? So one of them will relate to this, the counts of the number that have a certain characteristic, and the other will involve sort of having individual things where we could always count the number with that characteristic. Do you want to guess which is what? Yes. Uh, Ethan. Agent-based models in the left and stock and flow. Yeah. Agent-based models in the left and stock and flow. So I'm, I'm trying to bring you close to this because we're going through a more in, involved exercise, but this is, I'm trying to cut to the essence of it, okay? So Ethan is exactly right. Are people comfortable with that? This is agent-based. After all, we have individual squares broken out here, right, in circles. Whereas over here, we're counting. Where do we count in a system IMX model? Where do we count in a stock flow model? Where are those counts? Yes, uh, so, uh, uh, state your name. Probably, yes, that was my best guess, but, um, uh, I, I I stand uh, corrected. I knew it was either Rome or Alexandria or Troy. I'm just Yeah. Those counts are in stocks. Those counts are in stocks. At any one time, a stock has a count, right? Okay, good. Um, yes, so. Let's consider stock flow models. In stock flow models, we actually have counts. At any one time, the value of a stock is a count. Mm -hmm. And we actually subdivide the model. You, you may not have thought about it this way, but when we want to ask sort of what's the situation in the population, we subdivide the model by characteristic. You kind of stack up people. We just have a count of people who are in this bucket who are susceptible. A, a count of people who are in this bucket who are exposed. A count of people in this bucket who are infected, et cetera. Um, are we are we comfortable with that idea? So so the stocks represent counts, and in fact, they they indicate. Of those who are susceptible, how many are those? Of those who are exposed, how many of them right now? Of those who are infected, how many of them are there? And of those who are recovered, how many of them? Are, are we comfortable with that? So the organization of this model, how we kind of divide things up in this model, the subdivisions of this model, are by characteristics or the state of the system. We 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 put things into bins according here to their infection status. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm not like, waiting. Sorry. Um, the trust is like a problem. Um, okay. Um, in an agent-based model, the organization is different. How do we organize an agent-based model? What's the division? What's the set of things we divide it into? Particularly at one time. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. State charts? Um, okay, there are state charts that specify the state of a person with respect to a given concern. But uh, yes, Malcolm. In this case, a population of agents? Yeah, so we have, we actually have, at any one time, when we're running the model, we have. The current situation being characterized into different people, right? Or different individuals. I don't know. It could be service dogs, it could be cities, it could be schools or, or something along those lines. But but into individual agents. So when we're running it in a system dynamics model, running the model, we have a sock for each group of people in the population that have a certain characteristic. Here is just infection status. But in an agent-based model, at, at runtime, we have, oh, there's a person 
one person here, one person there, one person there, or agent here, agent there, agent there. Now, in a stock flow model, each of those stocks is a count. That's the data. Do you get that? If we run the model any one time, we freeze it. We have a count in each stock, right? That counts the number of people with those characteristics. In an agent-based model, what is the data? So, so the organization is by what's the data that we keep track of for each agent? Their characteristic, their state with respect to each state chart, for example. Maybe it's also their things like their age or things like their income or things like their immigration status or whatever. We keep track of that for each agent. So the organization in an agent-based model is by agent. The data maintained for each unit of organization, each agent, is the, the current state and characteristics of that agent. That's quite different from, an, from a stock flow model, where the organization is by characteristic, and for each of those, we keep track of a pump. Hmm? Do, you, do, you, do you see the relationship to this? So here we have, you know, for each for each item, we have some characteristic. It's green and it's a square, or it's red and it's a circle. Whereas in this table, we abstract away from those details, but we just keep track four things of a certain characteristic, green, that are green and then are squares, we have four of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make the analogy here as we're moving towards a, a bigger example. Do you get that understanding? So HMS model, we organize by individual. The data we keep track of is the characteristics, including the state and fixed characteristics, you know, unchanging characteristics of that individual. Whereas in stock flow, we organize by characteristic, including state, you know, like which stock they're in, and we count the number in that state. Are we good with this idea? Okay, so now I haven't talked about it much, but I want you to, I did allude to it one or two times from this fall, and I want to make sure it, it's something. Let's suppose that in our model, we want to go beyond just keep your track of characteristics by like infection effects, because that's one of those exposed, infected, and recovered. Suppose we also want to keep track of people's immigration status. So let's just say whether they're born in Canada or not. Hmm? Um, or, and maybe further, we want to keep track of their income level, whether it's their low income, medium income, or high income, something like that. How would we, how would we represent that in a model like this? Anyone? Oh, Babs, yeah. So you have to have a stock for each possible combination. You'd have a stock for each possible combination, right? Just like here, we need it. For every combination, we need an entry in this table that keeps track how many people of that sort, right? Or how many takes of that, right? that count. So we would need a combination. Now, I, I want to, we would need to keep track of that for every combination. So, so suppose we had these four characteristics by by infection status, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. That's four. Suppose we want to keep track whether someone was born in Canada or not. That's two. And then suppose we want to further have low, medium, high income. That's three. Mm -hmm. So four, two, three. How many combinations are there? Twenty-four. Four times two is eight times three is 24. Mm -hmm. 
You notice I'm multiplying the mm -hmm. Each successive one throws it multiplicatively. That's a fancy term, but it, if we wanted one more division, you know, for example, if someone is um, working age or not, we would, if they only have two distinctions, we would double the number of compartments. Do you have that idea? You have that idea, right? So as we add in a new distinction, type of distinction, we have multiplicative sort of increase in the number of distinctions we have to keep track of. We could think of them reasonably as kind of being almost each of these is being a cube, right? If if all we have to keep track of is like susceptible, exposed, recovered, and and, and infected and recovered, we we just show it like this. If we have to keep track of whether they're born in Canada or not, we could almost imagine there being another dimension, right? There's kind of in, in this uh, the stock, it's almost like we have layers. A susceptible born in Canada and behind it is susceptible not born in Canada. Mm -hmm. Infected born in Canada or exposed born in Canada and exposed not born in Canada. Um, these, these kind of layers. But as we get more, it's more like we have other dimensions we have to take up. And it's more like a cube. Okay, we're going to be coming to emphasize that. So, you know, we could we could do that. And in general, that will be a way of keeping track of this information. With an infectious transmission disease transmission model, what else would we have to do? Are each of those layers solitudes? Are each of them, you know, totally disjoint and independent of each other? No, why not? Wouldn't that have to be like essentially a subset of you? Like, so that the whole system is essentially like one big set that is divided into different. Okay, you could think of that, right? There's some sort of aggregation relationship that there's a mathematics associated with totally not something. That's actually a really good insight there. Um, and you might be interested in the number of people who are infected in this, you know, uh, in, who are infective in this immigration and, you know, income group, um, uh, or the number that are recovered in that one. And, and then you might be interested in the total number of people uh, infected across uh, all immigration status, but with a given income, and then totaling up to people infected of whatever income and whatever uh, immigration status. So, so there's an important aggregation relationship there and some beautiful mathematics involving lattices and pre-orders and um, wonderful things that I would love to talk about, but, but we don't have uh, time here. But what else, what else um, do we have to to bear in mind here when it comes to this this underlying mathematics when it comes to um, contagion it's it's each group independent of another the high the high income folks who are born in Canada and are susceptible do they have to do they have to be at all concerned I mean um Putting aside for the moment the human side of it, do they have any risk that's imposed if there's an outbreak among low-income people not born in Canada? They certainly do have some coupling. We're not solitude. And this is one of this is one of the big things that came from the COVID-19 pandemic, is um, you know, you you can't just say, well, that's over there. That outbreak is in this subgroup. I'm not a member of that subgroup. I'm, you know, um, I'm, I don't have to worry about that. No, I mean, what goes on there matters. If, if, if the developing world doesn't have good access to vaccines, 
if they're all sort of taken for the developed world and if it is too expensive to produce for the, the developing world, it's going to come around <laughs> to the developed world. We are in this together. And we can't simply say, well, they're in a different group that can't come here. There, there's going to be risk of transmission across lots, and and there are some important societies that learned this in a hard way to put all their emphasis against, you know, the dominant group. Singapore had this issue. They they put a huge emphasis on their main Singaporean native-born population, and they tended to under invest in. The immigrant population that actually does a huge amount of the labor that keeps the Singaporean economy going and lives in crowded dorms. And they ended up having big outbreaks that affected the native born Singaporeans because of that, right? You, you can't just bottle it up. Um, we are in this together. What goes around comes from. And in an infectious disease transmission model, what I'm saying is these layers or these different subcomponents can couple they can transmit to one another okay um but i i want to talk about you know in this in this system dynamics context where we are subdividing as bab said into separate stocks we're we're essentially making separate compartments for each combination of these there's a susceptible low income, not born in Canada um, group. And uh, there's a susceptible, not born in Canada, medium income group and a susceptible, not born in Canada, high income group and a susceptible born in Canada, low income group, et cetera. Every combination of this, right? Um, has its own separate stock, but there's coupling between them. They're not solid, they're not totally separate. One can transmit to the other. And that's what gets kind of challenging when you build these, these models. There's a, what I'd say, what, what I'm gonna term here, and this is a, a technical term, a combinatorial explosion. A cursive dimensionality is another term that you feel. What do I mean by a combinatorial explosion? Cursive dimensionality. Mm -hmm. It has to do with what I said earlier. As you add a distinction of heterogeneity, a further distinction, maybe it's income, maybe it's someone's, you know, um, self-identified gender, maybe it's someone's um, where they live, which city they live within Saskatchewan or what city or town. Each time you add one of those, how does the number of combinations go up? It goes up geometrically or exponentially or multiplicatively, all those pointing to the same thing. Technically, we, we like to say geometrically rather than exponential because it's a discrete change. We're not, we're not making it slightly larger, slightly larger, slightly larger, going up exponentially. It's like it multiplies by a, by a certain constant. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly accept gladly exponential. I mean, a geometric, a geometric is just an exponential for fixed uh, sort of discrete value. So we have this combinatorial explosion. But more than that, I will say, just as a modeler, um, as you add a new distinction here, as we say, oh, okay, we want to keep track now of where people live in the province, there's a lot of work required. What parts of the model? If, if I said, hey, I, I want to keep track of someone's self-identified gender, for example, um, uh, gender self-identification, where where would that affect the model? What would I have to change in the model? Is it just here? What's that? Everywhere. Does it affect this stock? Darn right, it affects that stock. Does it affect this? Yes, it does. This one, yes. The, every stock. And here, every flow, in fact, we have to keep track of because we have to do the bookkeeping, right? Now, in general, there's going to be more than that. There's going to be like mixing matrices. How much is this group accurate and so on? But at the least, 
even if there's minimal coupling, just to do the bookkeeping for each group, you need all the stocks here that keep track of the population status and all the flows captured. Now, for Ken's comment, you may also want to keep track of aggregation up, sort of different subtotals of the total population, you know, totaling it up to different levels of aggregation. And that's important. I mean, it's ubiquitous. We, we, we almost always want that. And that adds to this yet more. But at the least, you want, it's a global change. You, you say you want to add in and just up to heterogeneity? I got to go modify basically the entire model. I've got to go stratify it. Yes, Malcolm. Uh, so you mentioned mixing models there. So is that the primary way that we would capture kind of like how coupled some yeah. of those different dynamics are? Exactly. Yeah, how, where we have coupling between different groups. So we'd say that when it comes to infection, right now, it's a great question, Malcolm. Well, Malcolm was asking about mixing models and so on. Right now, we, we assume, in, in, as it's shown naively, if we just subscript to this by the group, we're assuming there are only their contacts are with people only in their group, for example. Um, but in general, um, we're going to need a term which says, how does group I mix with group J? You know, so um, how much do the folks who are uh born in canada and are low income mixed with the folks born in canada and medium income how much do they mix with the folks who are born in canada high income how much do they mix with the folks not born in canada who are low income and how much do they mix etc and you're going to need to keep track of sort of of their contacts how are those apportioned how are those divvied up by these different groups so that I can figure out if there's an outbreak in group X, how does it lead me to have risk that it will spread to, to me even though I'm in a different group? And, and there's something called a mixing matrix. That's why it's sub I comma sub J um, here. We, we need a, a matrix of, of different entries that say, how does group I Mix with each other group. How much of their, how much of their contacts with their own group, compared to this group, compared to that group, etc. And uh, there's a whole science to to figuring these things out. We have very detailed information on, for example, mixing patterns, and and these things matter when it comes to the spread of repressives, for example, which is undergoing considerable outbreaks even in our own province right now. They were just recruited to, to help do modeling from Newfoundland Labrador for their pertussis outbreaks. And there, there's a concern that, look, it may be that little kids that bring it home, but they may end up transmitting it to their grandparents. When they go to grandpa and grandma's to go see them, they may bring pertussis to that household. And then the grandpa and grandma may be at risk of more serious symptoms because they're older and have, have weaker immune systems. And so there's play back and forth and we, and we have information on this. Okay, I um, time is, uh, is moving on. I do want to get to a somewhat um, more extensive example on the mathematics of this. So I began by talking about a varied population, a heterogeneous population. A population, as Mr. Gishadi intoned, of differences. Mm -hmm. And I ask you to imagine certain characteristics by which they, they, they differ. And we saw that in an agent based model where we distinguish particular people, we actually have something that, in a way, mirrors what we see. In the world, at an abstract level, of course, we have individuals, and for each individual, we keep track of their ethnicity and their sex and their income. Right? Um, so it's a familiar notion, right? Um, that kind of mirrors what we see and mimics what we see out there. But we leave out a whole lot of characteristics, their hair color, and you know, details on their preferences or what have you. Um, 
By contrast, in agent in, in system dynamics model, why do I draw a cube here? Anyone? Relates to something Bab said earlier. Why? Why a cube? Yes, that's right. Three-dimensional matrix. The three-dimensional matrix. So for each characteristic here, we're imagining three types of information we're keeping track. For each combination, as Bab said, we have a count. We clear about that? Each of those combinations, we have a count. So for each item in this cube, we have a count of, of, of individuals. Um, and we need to, over time, as the model runs, it updates those counts, right? At any one time, there's a count for each of these. Maybe a count... And I, I'm not even here keeping track of, you know, what infection status they're in or something. So it could be for each of these stocks, we have such a cube and, and we're keeping track of, of, of those numbers. Now, the point here, and, and, I, and I, I think we've communicated this already, but I, I want to revisit it, the number of items in this cube, the number of facets of the cube, the number of subdivisions of the cube goes up geometrically. Yes, we add a new dimension, it goes up multiplicatively. If we, if we need to keep track of something else, like their, you know, whether or not they've graduated university, you know, yes or no, um, we double, we have yet another dimension that doubles the number of of uh, divisions we have to keep track of. We have to keep track of this for those not going to university and then for those who have gone to university. Are people clear about that? Okay, so the key mathematical components here is that we have a multiplication of the number of divisions. Um, if we have to divide by four infection status statuses and then two immigration statuses, and then three income statuses, we have this multiplication. That's why we had 24, right? Four times two times three. We good with this? So it's multiplicative, right? Multiplicative with system dynamics, with aggregate. Are people comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in HMA-based models, the situation is quite different, right? We have one or more populations and for each individual, they have some parameters that specify some fixed characteristics. We'll okay. keep those as fixed. Um, and, and then some state, some situation that's changing over time, maybe their infection status. So their parameters might include for this model, their income, whether or not they were born in Canada, right? Um, but their state might be their what their whether they're infected or not. We good with that, no mm -hmm. Um and in this characteristic, we will have when we run the model we'll have a runtime population that breaks these individuals out. Remember, I, I started off this discussion by distinguishing what we specify at statically in the model. What we specify when we, when we uh, describe the structure of the model, you might just say there's a population of size 10,000. When we actually run the model, there's by goodness, there's 10,000 people there, right? Right? Um, and for each of them, we'll, we'll keep track of those characteristics. Now, what's notable here um, is the mathematics of it, but also the, the um, flexibility uh, of this form of, of representation. So when we have a given individual, we can have attributes associated with that individual. Uh, 
So maybe in our model, we specify for persons, we have a uh, state chart that gives their infection status. And then maybe we have whether or not they were born in Canada. And maybe we have uh, their their income, you know, into three three characteristics, right? Um, uh, and then when we run it, each person in the population is tagged with their current infection status in that state chart, their, their income level, right? And whether or not they're born can. Are we good with this? No, okay. Um, but I want to highlight that we can keep track of other types of heterogeneity as well. For example, suppose we wanted to keep track of income, not as three levels low, medium, high. Suppose we want to keep track of it in terms of a dollar value. Essentially, a continuous quantity. By continuous, I mean it's like a could be summarized as a real number, right? It could be thirty-four thousand two hundred thirty-two and sixteen cents per year, right? Um, uh, or it could be two thousand four hundred and twenty-one per year, what have you, right? Um, could we do that in an HMS model? Could we associate each person with a real number, with a with a floating point number, for example? Darn right, we could. Could we do that in a system dynamics model? So, if we have this sort of model in a system dynamics model, can we keep track of of a continuous income? No, it's, we have to discretize it, right? Um, well, at least within the bounds of the underlying mathematics different ordinary, ordinary differential equations. We, we don't have the luxury of having a continuous value here, right? Um, associated with income. That would get us to the realm of what are known as partial differential equations. We would have a whole nother set of, of uh, set of needs, a set of complications, et cetera. Yeah? Um, yes, I'm not. Could you, uh, you you would assign a range. You would divide it up into like low, medium, high. Exactly, you're exactly uh, right along the lines uh, that you should be thinking. That's how we deal with these matters here. We break them up into typically fixed ranges. We turn it from continuous into what? Yes, sir. Yeah. I want to <laughs> please don't in the exam, please don't write it as D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T. -E That's different from C-I-S-C-R-E-T-E. -E -E. So not the same. Okay. Um the correct word for it is discrete, meaning it's divided up into a set of uh specific a set of specific concrete possibilities of categorical sort of thing. It's, it's not discrete. What what is discrete mean? So uh, it means what? Like it means <laughs> yeah, it involves like it, we 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 won't tell anyone about it. Well, it's gonna be it's going to be secret. It's not discrete. It's it's discrete. Okay. It, it, it's it's it, I know English is terrible. I'm sorry. Um, but but uh, if you're going to use it, please write it this way. Because if you ever write, you you mean this, but you write it this way, people will sort of snicker and think you're referring to some you know some secret. Um, you don't want other people to know about. Um. Okay. So here we don't have the option of specifying continuous heterogeneity. We have to, if we have continuous heterogeneity, as Amna said, we break it up into discrete bins, as it were, as it were. discrete possibility, low income, medium income, high income. Are we okay with that? No. Okay, let me let me emphasize another type of heterogeneity, though. Okay. Um Relational heterogeneity. What, what when I say relational, anyone want to like that? 
Yes. Um, the characteristics relative to other agents characteristics. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. It's a question of information that encodes some that that refers to something else. You know? it, 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 it's a relation to something else, a relationship with something else. For example, we can keep track. What was my city of birth? Hmm? Maybe that's an agent in the model, the city that we represent. What's my city of birth? I can keep track who is who is my mother, right? In the model. Um, maybe maybe she has a disproportionate influence on me in the model. Uh, I could keep track where is my home. Did did your model one last week have people have homes? That's an example of relational information. One agent is referring to another. In general, we don't have, and, and in general, that can, if we if we follow that out, as we'll soon emphasize in this class from this very floor, we'll have network structure. We're going to spend quite a bit of time with network. Mm -hmm. Probably ask you to watch the video and, and we'll discuss it. Networks are super important. They're they're a hugely important form of mediator for interaction. Um, they have really interesting structure associated with the network. You can have, you can have distance-based networks that are locally proximal. We can have scale-free networks that that have long tails, heavy so-called heavy tail distributions. Where most people have few, but some people have a huge amount, disproportionately large. We can have small world networks, whereby most of my connections are local, but some of mine are very distant. Mm -hmm. Networks have really interesting structure, but equally important, they have very, very interesting dynamics associated with them. The spread of infection across networks. Or of other sorts of dictation, spread of information, spread of innovation, right? Um, spread of disinformation, the conspiracy theory, such as is widespread right now on this very day south of the border. And perhaps not entirely unknown within our fair country. So relational characteristics open up a world for us of keeping track of. These, these things like network structures that have really profound implications for our understanding, but more also, also, ladies and gentlemen, for intervention, for, for bending the curve, for changing things. Um, anyone think during the pandemic, what intervention, what sort of public health measure affected networks, particularly early on, there's a real emphasis on something. What was it? And, and lockdown, it, it definitely affected networks. Who I meet is very different if I'm at home all the time than if I come in here and eat all food, right? Francisco. Social distance. Social distancing means I have contact with fewer people in the course of the day. My network shrinks. And there's some type of intervention that explicitly takes into account our networks to find new cases. What was that? Anyone remember? Yes, uh, Kate? Yeah, contact tracing. Contact tracing. That's using network structure to sort of find cases intelligently, not just finding them anywhere old out in the population, but hey, being intelligent, marshalling your limited resources to prioritize, hey, the folks who might be most likely to be infected right now or greatest risk of developing infection are those who are neighbors in a network sense of others with whom they've had contact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in HMS models, heterogeneity, we, we have much more freedom with respect to capturing heterogeneity, not just discrete heterogeneity, but also continuous heterogeneity. 
we can keep track of people's geography, right? Latitude, longitude, where they live, right? How would we do that in a in a in a stock flow model? Keep track of latitude, longitude. Uh, uh, what's that? You have to have a combination for every latitude, longitude. Well, yeah, and if the real number is your you're in general not going to be able to, to, to capture that. But what you could do is what Abna said. You break it up into chunks, right? You have maybe little grid squares. Or maybe you say, we'll have a different sub value of the subscript for each city in Saskatchewan. Are they in Regina? Are they in Saskatoon? Are they in Prince Albert? Are they in North Battleford? Are they in Moose? Right? Um, we can capture in agent based models continuous uh, heterogeneity, discrete heterogeneity, sure, sure, no problem, relational heterogeneity in a network. So, and this is really important. This is central to the enterprise of agent based modeling, but tricky to capture even coarsely within, within a stock flow model. Awkward to capture. As I'm going to say, we have to modify. Each time we add in, if we think, oh, you know, maybe we really should keep track of people's uh, income level because this is new study which shows lower income people are much more likely, you know, have much larger number of connections per day than, than people of higher income. If we wanted to do that in a stock flow model, we would have to modify all across the model. We can, if we want to, well, you tell me, if we want to add in, a new distinction for an agent-based model. How hard is it? How hard is it? What do we have to do? So, so think yes. No. Yeah, you just update the object that serves as your agent, basically. So the increase yeah. of whatever memory footprint that has That's across right. and agents. That's right. And it increases it multiplicatively or additively. Additively. Mm -hmm. If we have to keep track of, so we have a person agent, and we want to keep track, now maybe we are keeping track of their age and, and their income, and to, uh, but you have a real number or what have you, um, um, maybe even geography. And now we want to keep track, were they born in Canada or not? For that, for each, for, in that person agent, for, for, or think about a given person in the population, how much information, if, if all we want to keep track of is were they born in Canada or not, how much information do we need to encode that for each person? Mm -hmm. One bit, right? One or zero. Added, we just added in. Do we have to double the number of things we have to keep track of? No, we just keep track for them. For me, remember, in an agent based model, we subdivide the population, right, by by uh, individual, and for each individual, we keep track of their characteristics. So now for each individual, I'm keeping track of one more bit, right? Whereas if I had to keep track of that in a stock flow model, I'd, I'd need another layer, right? It would require a change all across the that stock flow model. I'd have to update the flows or update the stocks for an interface model. Would it require changing all the state charts, all the different characteristics? No, just anything that has to care about it. Yeah, you, know, you, you want to modify, but you don't have to. There's no obligation to update all of that. Right? It's a very localized change. It really only affects those things which you need it to affect in the model. So it's it's not it's not as promiscuous in terms of what it gets you to to change. Adding that extra bit of information is additive and it's localized in its effect. Do you understand that point? Hmm? We don't have to go back and modify the entire model just because we need this stinking single bit that says whether or not someone was born in Canada. You 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 comfortable with that? Whereas here we 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 do. That has a real impact on the nimble research model. And if you think this is purely theoretical, then yeah. 
as the pandemic went on and we were serving all the provinces, First Nations Reserves and Six reporting out daily for our province, we'd all the time encounter some heterogeneity and we'd say, you know, do we can we afford to, to modify the model to take this in account? And it, it's promiscuous, it affects all across the model. And whenever you affect things across the model, just like any any time Babs would know, you affect things across your entire code base of a big software program, there's a risk of what? Errors being introduced. You fail to do it consistently, and then, then you have a problem. And so you have to balance, like, can I afford to add this? An engine-based model can be much more nimble. You can add this thing in, only hitch it up to just a few things that you might want to have depend on it. You don't have to modify things globally. Okay, so, you know, if we started to get serious about wanting to keep track of more information, mm -hmm. suppose the province territory in which people live, um, where they were born in, in Canada, including other. Maybe we divide, maybe, maybe we'll forego. Clearly, if we wanted to keep track of continuous age, which type of modeling is our ticket? Sorry? Age and base would be a deal. You're not going to keep track of continuous age in a stock global. Again, without going to partial differential equations, which is a massive enterprise and requires entirely different um, set of, of considerations. Suppose you want to also keep track of their vaccination status, which vaccine have they received, their weight category maybe, their smoking status. The number of possible combinations, well, 13 for this, 14 for this, 16 for this, so on, 139,776 combinations. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of combinations. Uh, that you'd have to keep track of. This cube is not only three dimensions. How many dimensions in the cube now? Maybe six. Six dimensions. I won't ask you to visualize that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can imagine taking this cube and extending it one more dimension. It's almost in time. Yet another dimension. Yet another. And, and you'd be dealing with, you know, this massive blow up of home cube. It's multiplicative to a set of all combinations, right? Now, suppose in a stock global, we needed to keep track of, say, a count of people infected in each of these divisions, right? Um, maybe so for each of these divisions, for susceptible, maybe we want to keep track of the count of people who are susceptible for that division. Well. We need an integer for each of these combinations. So we need half a megabyte just to keep track of susceptibles for each possible combination of these. Now, quite a few of these might be empty, right? They might have zero people on them, but we still have to keep track of that. Mm -hmm. By contrast, with an HMA small, what will we have to keep track of? For each individual, suppose we had, maybe I'll be simplest. I'll start with age group. We have 16 combinations. How many, how much information? How much data do I have to keep track of for each individual, um, each agent, to encode 16 possible values? It would be, Four bits, right? One bit encodes two possibilities. Two bits encode how many? Four. Three bits encode eight. Four bits encode 16. So each person would need four bits for this. That's the kind of log base two of 16 is four. You get that? And then we have to do something similar for the province territories here. You don't have full 16, you have 13, but we'll we'll round it up and say four, we'll use four bits to encode these, even though we don't have another three to round it out. First province territory, similar. 
So what is this little funny symbol that looks like half a square bracket? Yeah, it's sealed. It's sealed. Yeah. I think you've seen that from maybe your discrete mathematics course, maybe. Um uh in any case, um uh so here we have this many bits to keep track of the first one for each agent. This many bits, um, the log base two of 14, the ceiling of it. Log base two of 16 to include the age group, right? Uh, vaccination status and so on, right? How much, how much does it require in total per person? 18 bits per person. Per person of the population. Now, you could rightly say, there could be a lot of people in the population. Darn right, there could be a lot of people in the population. Um, but each person uh, would would keep track of, of, of that, right? Um, now, uh, you might say, yes, there, there could be a lot of people in the population, and uh, and that's that is uh, correct, and and this will end up contributing to the total amount of memory that's needed uh, for this population. So. Now we're going to have N people, capital N, I say samples. Um uh and and uh we're going to keep track of the amount of information here. So if we just count the number of of individuals here um who well excuse me, um uh here we're we're dealing with uh uh, we're going to be dealing with Asian based, uh, and then down here we're going to be dealing with counts. So up here we're going to be dealing with uh, a set of possible values across all of these possibilities. Um, and so six, thirteen, um, uh, thirteen here, fourteen here, sixteen here, etc. And what we have to represent for an agent based model is just the 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 log of that number of of bits and again rounded up the the ceiling here which is the same as as uh, that value uh, there by contrast if we want to store them as counts of of all possible combinations we would have um, this many different counts and this is multiplicative we need uh, the number of items in the cube is going to be 13 times 14 times 16 times 4 times 4, et cetera. Um, so uh, here, the an important point is for a stock flow model, uh, you have this cube at any one time. How does it vary with population size? So we've been emphasizing to encode the heterogeneity. If I have a population of uh, 100,000 or a population of a million or a population of 100 million, does it change the number of items in the cube? No, because each item in the cube holds a what? We've been emphasizing it, a count, right? Or keep a track of the number of people who are born in a given province and in a given the birth province of a certain age group of a certain point. And for each of those combinations, we keep track of the count. Let's say it's susceptible to that character. And separately, we have cube for infection, separately, a cube for exposed, separately, a cube for, for recovered. But those cubes, it just counts, right? So if we wanted a bigger population, the counts would be larger, but it doesn't require more memory. Just larger value. Right? Instead of being 100 people in this in this particular value in the queue, maybe it will be a thousand. Doesn't increase our running time at all, does it? With an age-based model, by contrast, the amount of information that we have to maintain per person might be you know 18 bits, but then we have the number of people and that we have to be track for. And there's a big difference if you have to keep track of 18 bits for 100,000 people versus for a million people versus for 10 million, right? In terms of the total amount of information you have to maintain. Now, 
What's notable though is that how these things scale. You might think it's obvious it's going to require much more memory to store in a database model because you have a population, you know, a million people, 18 bet three. But in a stock flow model, as we said, you can very easily, because of the combinatorics of it, because the multiplicative nature, you can easily get into the multi-megabyte range for stock. Do people, do you, do you see that point? You have this multiplicative relationship and you might get megabytes of information required, of counts that you have to keep track of just to keep track of all the divisions. So it's not always the case that an agent-based model will be using a lot more memory. It could be, it could be the other way around once you start getting to heterogeneity. And as you add heterogeneity in, it multiplicatively increases the memory for stock flow. It also gets really awkward to add these things, the reason on the memory that it's, it requires change in the entire model. So take home. Aggregate SD models um, for population size of, of, of size. And it's, as you change N, the population size, it doesn't change the running time at all. It doesn't change the memory at all. There's larger chunks, right? Um, as you add heterogeneity, it grows multiplicatively. There's this curse of dimensionality, this combinatorics. You, have, you make one more distinction, born in Canada or not, and you double the amount of, of memory that's required. You cannot represent continuous dimensions. It's really awkward often to modify the model. It's, it involves global changes across the entire model. Um, and for this reason, we often end up having less distinctions captured in the model. It's just too awkward, too cumbersome too inflexible. For an agent-based model, does the population size matter for its runtime? Darn right it matters. You double the population size, typically at least double the runtime. Now, if anyone's really so interested, you want to think about parallelization opportunities, we could talk. But generally speaking, as you double the population size for us, straightforward implementation, you at least double the runtime and the memory. There's, there's uh, as you grow the, the heterogeneity, it does grow, but it grows additively, not multiplicatively. You keep track of two more bits to encode whether per person, whether or not they're, they're um, born in Canada. You can regularly capture continuous dimensions and relational heterogeneity, things like networks. And there's no need to coarse grain, as, as Amna said, income. We can keep track of it continuously, okay? So some trade-offs between agent-based and system dynamics model in terms of nimbleness, in terms of memory footprint, in terms of running time with scaling of heterogeneity and scaling the population. We will revisit some of these issues potentially as early as Thursday. Um, but soon we'll be getting to networks which um, take advantage of this structure. Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, do recall the, the assignment is out. Thank you.